Now that you have completed the matrix solving warmup, you are more aware of the wide variety of ways logical features can manifest in these problems. You also probably notice that most of the time, several of these types of logics are combined together in very complex ways. In this video, I will show you the most common patterns of logic you can find in a matrix across its rows, columns, and diagonals. In this example, the logic here is governed by the change in color, fill, and pattern of the shapes throughout the matrix. If we take a look at our 159 diagonal, we can see that all three of these elements share the same pattern. They are horizontal stripes. If we look to the rest of our groups of three that are present in a 159 diagonal, we should see that elements 2, 6, and 7 also share a pattern, this kind of polka dot pattern. And then the last group of three, elements three, four, and eight, all share a solid black fill, solid black color, solid black pattern. Sometimes the underlying logic can govern how many shapes or features are present in each element. Some common examples of this include changes of the number of edges of any given shape, the number of curved versus straight lines, the number of shapes within or outside of other shapes, and the number of lines. In this example, the number of shapes is governed by the logic of our rows and the logic of our columns. If we take a look at the logic of our rows, we can see that the same number of shapes is present in each element throughout the entire row. In the top row, there are five shapes in each element. In the middle row, there are four shapes in each element. And in the bottom row, there are three shapes in each element. From top to bottom in each of our columns, we are removing one of the white shapes. So if we start in our left column, between the first and second element of the column, we are getting rid of one of the white elements. Not that one, the top right one. And then we get rid of the other remaining white element between the second and third elements of that column. Same thing is true of column two. We get rid of the right white element, and then we get rid of the last remaining white element. And again in column three, eliminate the one on the right, eliminate the one on the left. Rotations and flips are very common logic patterns. Usually the entire element will rotate in the same direction, but it is possible for only certain parts of the element to rotate or for different parts of the same element to be rotating in two different ways. In these type of matrix problems, the elements can either be rotated clockwise or counterclockwise. Clockwise is if you were to look at the face of a clock and watch the way the hands naturally move around the clock. If you started from the top, they're moving to the right, down and around the clock. That is clockwise. So if you were to rotate something kind of towards the right side, that would be clockwise. Counterclockwise would be if the hands of the clock moved the opposite way they were supposed to. If you started from the top of the clock, went to the left, down and around, that would be counterclockwise. Rotations can also be done in different degrees. So if I were to take this triangle, the three most common rotations are 45 degrees, which looks like that, 90 degrees, which looks like this, and 180 degrees, which looks like this. You can also do something that is called a flip, and flips can be both horizontal and vertical. Let me zoom out just a little bit. A horizontal flip would look like this, and a vertical flip would look like this. Sometimes it's very easy to confuse flips with 180 degree rotations because again I'll show you this triangle up here when we rotated it 180 degrees it looks about the same as a 180 degree flip. So what you have to do in questions like this where they ask you um, where you're trying to debate whether it is a 180 degree rotation or a flip um, is just really pay attention to the shape, pay attention to any special patterns or shading that could clue in whether it was flipped as if it was looking in a mirror or if it was rotated. In this example, the rotation of the elements is governed by the logic of our columns. If we take a look at each column from top to bottom, we can see that each element is being rotated 90 degrees clockwise. If I take the first element in column one and rotate it 90 degrees clockwise, it matches the element right below it. If I take that next element and rotate it another 90 degrees, it now matches the uh, element right below it in the same column. If we do the same thing for the second column, first element rotated 90 degrees matches the second element of the column. Second element of the column 
rotated 90 degrees again matches the third element of the column. And the same thing will be true in column three. The first element rotated 90 degrees matches the second element. The second element rotated 90 degrees will match the third element. Whoops, the third element. Sometimes the underlying logic can govern how aspects of the elements may move or change. Some common examples of this are shapes getting closer together or farther apart, shapes increasing or decreasing in size, shapes appearing or disappearing, shapes moving within the frame of the elements, and shapes becoming thicker or thinner. In this example, there are two different types of movement affecting the elements. From left to right in our rows, the black area in each element is expanding to the right and covering up the gray area. So from left to right in each of our rows, black is slowly becoming the more dominant color and pushing that gray color away. From top to bottom in our columns, parts of the shape are disappearing. First, we're getting rid of this top right corner, as you can see here. And then we are getting rid of some of the bottom right corner and some more of that top left corner to give us our third element in each column. The same is true for all of the other elements. First, get rid of this corner, then get rid of a little bit from either side, and you will get the shape in the third element. And same is true for our third column as well. The shape within each element may change in various ways. The entire shape itself could change, like a circle becoming a square. The structure of the lines may change, like a solid line becoming a dotted line or a very thick line becoming a thin line. And the ending of these lines could change, like an arrowhead becoming a bullet point or the line may end in nothing at all. In this example, all of the elements in each column are the same shape. In the first column, we have circles. In the first, oh, excuse me, in the middle column, we have squares. And in the third column, we have pentagons. Each row is changing the format of each of these shapes. The middle row is the original shape, unaltered. The top row is compressing the shapes, making them shorter and a bit wider, while the bottom row is stretching the shapes, making them taller and a bit thinner. Now we're going to talk about some unique matrix structures. This example is a four building block structure. In these types of problems, four elements are building blocks that interact with each other to create the remaining five elements in the matrix. The ways in which these building block elements can interact with each other varies from matrix to matrix. Sometimes the building blocks combine to form a new shape. Sometimes aspects of one building block change the colors of the next building block. Sometimes one building block may cause certain parts of another to disappear or cancel out, and sometimes building blocks can add or subtract from one another, like an arithmetic problem. In this example, the building blocks are elements 1, 2, 4, and 5. These are combined together from top to bottom to give us the elements in the bottom row, or they are combined from left to right to give us the elements in the right column. To find the missing element in these cases, it is easiest to combine the elements from the right column together or from the bottom row together. But you could also combine all four of the building blocks together to find your missing element nine. Let's do an example. Here, elements 1, 2, 4, and 5 are our basic building blocks. If we wanted to build our right column of shapes, we would need to take element 1 and combine it with element 2. And that would give us the same shape that we have in element 3. If we wanted to create this shape, we would need to combine element 4 with element 5 to get the shape in element 6. If we wanted to create the bottom row, we would need to combine element 1 to element 4, and that would give us the shape at the bottom of that column. If we wanted to find the bottom of the middle column, we would need to combine elements 2 and 5 to get the shape at the bottom of the middle column. And if we wanted to find our missing element, element 9, we would either have to combine the elements of the 
third column or the third row to get our missing element. Or we could also combine all four building blocks together to get this shape, which will match what we have in element nine. Sometimes in building block matrices, an entire row or column could be made of building blocks. In this case, the entire first row combined with the entire middle row gives us the entire bottom row. So if we wanted to create this element, we would need to add together the shape from element one to the shape in the element below it. And that would give us a match of the third element in that column. If we wanted to get this shape down here, we would need to combine the shapes from the first element in that column with the shapes in the second element in that column, and that would give us the third element in that column, which matches this H shape. And finally, if we wanted to, I'm going to draw this one because it will appear a bit better. If we wanted to find the missing element, element nine, we would combine the shapes found in the first and second element of that column, and that would give us a perfect match of the third element in that column, element nine. In this example, the left and the middle columns are the building blocks that create the right column. When we're combining any two elements in the first two columns, the lines that the shapes share are going to cancel out and not be present in that third element. So if we look between element one and element two and see that these lines are shared by both elements, we can see that those lines are not present in the third element. They have canceled each other out. What remains are the unique shapes and lines that are only present in one of the elements. Let's take a look at the second row. Here, these three lines are shared between the two elements, and that means those three lines are not going to be present in the third element. They have canceled each other out, leaving behind this cross shape that was unique to only one of the elements. In the bottom row, the shapes that are shared are this arch and the line that cuts through the center of the shape, leaving behind just the unique shapes. The shapes that are unique to just one of the elements. This little S shape. This pattern of logic is called the two by two steps. It is a common pattern in which two processes happen simultaneously starting from element one. One process starts in element one and continues two steps to the right. The first step colored in green, the second step colored in blue. The other process starts from element one and goes one step down colored in yellow and then another step down colored in red. As you can see in the diagram, every element is some combination of these two steps. For instance, in the middle column, uh, if we were to take two steps down from green, we've completed the green step, we add a yellow step, then we add a red step. And in the third column where the missing element is, we've completed steps one and two, the green and blue steps, and now we need to add the yellow and red steps, the two steps downward. Let's do an example. In this two by two matrix, if we start in element one and take one step to the right, we are adding a vertical line. We started with one, now we have two vertical lines. If we take another step to the right, we are adding another vertical line, giving us three vertical lines. If we were to start in element one and take one step down, we add one horizontal line. We started with one, now we have two. If we take another step down, we now have three horizontal lines. So to find the missing element, element nine in this case, we would need to start at element one, take two steps to the right, and then two steps down. So we would add two vertical lines and add two horizontal lines, meaning that we will have three vertical lines and three horizontal lines. 
This is a special case of the two by two steps pattern called the diagonal wave. In this pattern, one step makes the same change no matter which direction you go. This makes several elements in the matrix identical to one another. If you started in element one and took one step to the right, or one step down, you would end up with the same result, making elements two and four identical to one another. If you were to take two steps to the right, two steps down, or one step to the right and one step down, or one step down and one step to the right, you would end up with all three identical elements, elements three, five, and seven. Elements six and eight are also identical because they are each three steps away from the starting point. The only two elements that are completely unique are elements one and elements nine, the starting point and the ending point of this matrix. This pattern of change from the top left corner to the bottom right corner takes on the shape of a diagonal wave, which is where this matrix gets its name. Sometimes, though it is much less common, the starting point can be element three instead of element one, meaning that the wave will start in the top right corner and go down to the bottom left corner. In this case, element nine, your missing element, will be identical to elements one and five. Let's do an example. In this diagonal wave pattern, we are starting in element one, and every step either to the right or down will add a line. One step to the right or down will add a vertical line, and then the next will add a horizontal line. The next would add a vertical, the next would add a horizontal. So we're alternating between vertical and horizontal lines. If we look one step to the right or one step down, both of those shapes are identical. So I will mark them both with the same color. Then our next three elements should all be one, two steps away, one, two steps away, one, two steps away, one, two steps away. So all three of these elements are also identical because they are three steps away. So we've added a vertical line and now there is a horizontal line added in each of these elements. The next shapes are three steps away. So we went one, two, and then down three. We went, whoops, one, two, and over three. So these two are also identical to one another. We added a horizontal line in the last series, so we're adding a vertical line in this one. So now the only one left is our missing element, element nine. We just added a vertical line, so we need to add another horizontal line, and that's exactly what we did. So that's the entire diagonal wave matrix. In the next section, you're going to read about some time management tips, and then you will continue on to try your first full-length matrix simulation.